Happy New Year! Hey guys, welcome to the first video of 2023. I'm happy to see you guys came back. We have a lot to talk about this year um, and uh, I'm very excited. I think it's going to be an awesome year. So upwards and onwards. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but you know, I, I work at a startup. I'm a co-founder of a startup. And whenever I tell my friends or family or, you know, other people that I work at a startup or I'm a co-founder, I always get these like bullshit reactions. Like they look at me like, you know, well, you have it easy or it's, you know, uh, it's easy for you to do something or, you know, you don't really know what's going on in the real world. And, and I decided that I, once and for all, once and for all, I want to put to bed all of the misconceptions that exist about owning a startup, having a startup, being in a startup. And I want to make sure that I get that message through so that I don't get those <laughs> weird kind of looks anymore. So what I did is I asked all of my friends, everybody I know, um, you know, when I say startup, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? I compiled a list. And basically today I'm going to bust through all of those myths that exist about startups. So stick around, check it out. All right, guys. So today it's going to be quite straightforward. We're just going to talk about all of the myths and bust a bunch of them about startups. I've been in the startup world for, you know, four years now. Uh, I'm coming from the consulting world. I'm coming from marketing. So I kind of have seen both sides. Uh, I've, I've you know, owned my own brand, owned my own company, had a consulting firm, worked at a consulting firm. And now about four years now, I'm in a startup. I'm a co-founder. There's a lot of things that you don't see when you're on the outside. And uh, I compiled a list and we're just going to go through them one by one. So let's get to it. Myth number one, getting rich by having a startup is easy. I think that's a common misperception. Everybody thinks that having a startup, yeah, what's the problem? You have a good idea. You put something together on a website. People start, you know, collect users. People start buying it. You drive traffic to the site. Uh, and then, you know, you get funding and more funding and more funding and more funding and you become a billionaire. Uh, that's not really how it works. Uh, having your own startup is super, super fucking hard. Like, like extremely hard. In the end, ultimately, it's a business. It's like owning your own business. And just like any other business, it has its ups and downs. Uh, and it has, most importantly, a lot of sacrifice. We sacrifice a lot because we believe that what we're doing will have an impact, that what we're doing means something. So being a startup founder is probably one of the hardest things you can be. A lot of your friends, a lot of your family is going to tell you, no, don't do it. They're not going to believe in your idea. They're not going to believe in what you want to accomplish. They're not going to believe in your cause. They're not going to believe that you can make money. Uh, so you have to have a lot of determination and you have a lot of willpower to kind of drive through that. It also takes a lot of discipline. I wake up every single morning at 6.30. I get up, I, you know, I, I do my thing. I have my own sort of you know, productivity process, if you will. Uh, I don't think I'm super efficient. I need to be more efficient, but it's a constant struggle. You gotta be very, very disciplined in what you do. Uh, and you, you almost have to overwork, if you will, because it's not a nine to five job. You're always on, you're always working. So. It's not easy at all. So getting rich by having a startup is easy is a, is a pure myth. Uh, and we, we have to stop thinking about it that way. Second one is uh, when you do have a startup, I, I heard a lot of this about the, the, uh, the IT ecosystem, right? That a lot of people are talking about this. And they told me that you can't survive without funding. So you have to have investments. You have to have funding. Uh, Pre-seed, seed, round A, round B, round C, et cetera. So you can't survive. You have to have money. There has to be investment. So what are you spending if you don't have an investment? Um, we don't believe in this. This is a pure, pure myth. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have funding. Funding is necessary when you want to grow and accelerate, but you can continue your organic growth and bootstrap all the way to two, three, five, 20, $50 million a year revenue, easy. Uh, we cross the threshold where we're over uh, a certain amount. And I think from that point of view, we bootstrapped all the way. And uh, the positive thing about bootstrapping and not really going into that rev uh, fundraising cycles is that we, uh, we know that all of the money that we're generating is coming from sales which means we have demand. We know that our product has demand. We know that we are adding value. Uh, so from that perspective, no, you don't necessarily need funding to survive. 
uh, just the opposite right now. If you look at the IT world, a lot of the companies that are funded are not surviving. They're having issues. Uh, their runway has become much, much shorter. Uh, so in the companies that have bootstrapped are surviving because they're generating actual demand and they're generating revenue. Before I move on, I just want to you know, if you're watching this, and I'm sure if you're from a startup or uh, you have friends that are in a startup, uh, you also have some ideas and some misconceptions or myths about startups. So let me know in the comment section below and I'll make sure that uh, that I get to it and I'll comment on that. Uh, we'll look at it. We'll do a little bit of research and we'll let you know if it's a myth or if it's reality and, and what that might look like. So drop me a comment below. The next myth is if you have a great idea, you can find investment. A great idea is enough to find money, to find investment. There's a lot of money. You just have to have a good idea to be able to bring the investment. This is absolutely not true. There's so many different factors and so much complexity that goes into actually getting funded. I've spoken to a lot of VCs and a lot of the VCs have the same sort of mindset, same mantra, if you will. They say, I'd rather invest into an A team with a B idea rather than a B team with an A idea. So they're not just investing in your idea, they're not just investing in your product, but they're, what they're really doing is investing into your team, it's the founders. They believe that you are the management team, the people that can grow this business and ultimately generate capital gain for them, right? It's not just the idea, it's the team. Uh, you can have great ideas, a lot of people have great ideas, but if you can't be the entrepreneur, if you can't generate growth, if you can't bring in users, if you can't generate demand, if you can't manage that business, then they're not gonna invest. So no, having a great idea is not good enough for an investment. It's only the starting point. The team is probably even more important than the idea you have. If you have a great team, uh, it's easier to generate revenue. If it's not idea A, then you move on to idea B. If it's not idea B, you move on to idea C. And you can always shift and pivot, but the team is there to stay. Next one, uh, I, I like this one a lot. As soon as I get my first funding, everything's going to fall into place. I just have to make it to the first funding ground. I just have to make it to seed or pre-seed. I just have to get the first million dollar investment and then I'm golden. I'm set. Everything will fall into place. Oh my God, this is not true whatsoever. This is just the opposite. Once you get that first funding, everything becomes more chaotic. You actually work more uh, there's more problems, uh, more money, more problems, right? Uh, but you get more problems. You, the growth, uh, it has to be higher. All of a sudden, there's expectations. There's a board. Uh, you have to keep the board happy. There's just so many things that come to it. It's an investor. They put money. They want to get the money back. And if you can't deliver more money back, then you're going to have a problem. So there's just the pressure goes to a whole nother level when you get that first investment. So getting to that first investment is not going to make everything fall into place. Make sure you have your ducks in a row before you take that investment so that when you do get the money and the money does come in, you can accelerate your growth and not just sit around and think, well, okay, we got the money. Well, what, what do we do now? What are we supposed to be doing now? You have to know what you're doing before you take any type of money. Next one, and I get this one a lot actually, is uh, I'll quit my full-time job when my startup can pay me what I'm making. So a lot of people out there have full-time jobs. So they're making 80, 100, 120K a year. And they're, they're trying to jump into a startup world. They kind of founded another company. And they're kind of doing that company as a side gig just to a point where they can generate enough revenue so that they can pay their salary themselves and then jump into the startup. This is crap. It's simply not true. Uh, you can't have your startup as a side gig. There's a lot of people out there that are not doing it as a side gig. If you have an idea, if you have a great, great idea, and it's innovative, it's new, it's groundbreaking, right? 10,000 people have the same idea, at least. A thousand people have already started working on that idea. They have a company founded. A hundred of them already have a product and 10 of them are already successful. This is the reality of the world. So if you're doing something half-assed, you're simply not gonna beat the competition because there are people out there that are doing it full time. Uh, you can't do it as a side gig. It's not a startup is not a project. A startup is a business and it has to be and you have to kind of go into it knowing that you're taking on risk. You have to take on risk. If you don't have enough money to sustain yourself for the next two, three months, maybe opening a startup isn't for you. If you can't risk not having any income for three, four months, 
maybe a startup is not for you. So think twice. That side gig sort of scenario is probably the worst because you're going to half-ass it at your current job, you're going to half-ass it with your startup, and none of them is going to work, and you're simply going to be stuck with where you are. Or even worse, you're going to lose your job and your startup won't grow which is the worst case scenario. So no, I quit my full-time job when my startup can pay me what I make. Myth. Broken. Before I go on to the next myth, if you made it this far, please help us out. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, we're almost at a thousand subscribers. So, so close, so close. Help us reach that thousand mark. And from then we'll go to 10,000, 100,000, a million, and so on. So please take five seconds, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we get when we get new content out and help us out. On to the next myth. I really like this one. This one's a fun one. So during a funding round, the higher the valuation, the better. So these valuations are sometimes crazy, 100 million, 200 million, 500 million valuation, et cetera. So when you're going into a funding round, if it doesn't matter if it's seed, pre-seed, A, B, C, whichever round you're in. If you're just looking for you know, money from your family and friends, how do you value it? How much is your company worth? Uh, when you're deciding how much your company is worth, the higher is not always better. It's not. This is where like slow and steady wins the race. It's the tortoise and the hare. You really don't want to be the hare. You want to be the tortoise. You want to be the guy that ends up at the finish line, at the unicorn line, at the 1 billion mark. Uh, you don't want to be the hare that runs and then runs out of steam halfway through. So how valuation works is every time you do a funding round, the valuation must, must be higher. It has to be higher than the previous. And not higher by like 100 million, then you do 110 million. If you do 100 million, the next round should be you know, 200, 250, 400. It has to be a higher jump. So anytime you do any funding round, when you're deciding what the valuation is, always take into account what your valuation is going to be in the next round. If you're doing a round now for 12 million, then a year from now, and you're getting a year runway, so you have a year of money, and then a year from now, you're going to have to do another round. That other round has to be for 50 million. So if you want to go from 12 million to 50 million, can you actually go from 12 to 50 in a year? Is it possible? Can you grow at that rate? Are you able to? Is your team on board? Because if you jump the gun and you do it for a higher valuation, then the next round, you're going to be screwed because the expectations only go up. So make sure that your valuation is real. It's solid. You're standing on financial ground. You know that the round after the current round, you can deliver on that growth, right? A great example, a pandemic. A great example, war, you know, shit happens in the world. And these types of things are going to continue to happen in the world. And if your one way gets shortened from three years to one year or two years, and you have to do another round, you have to make sure that round is still higher than the round that you did. In order to do that, you have to be very objective, stand on solid ground, don't overshoot. I'd rather actually have a lower valuation, have the expectations a little bit lower. Uh, you know, you're giving out a little bit more of a percentage, but in the long run, if you end up with you know, 45% or you end up with 41% or 38%, the difference isn't going to be as significant as if you can't actually reach the billion dollar valuation mark. So if you have that in mind, if you have IPO in mind, then make sure that your valuation rounds are standing on solid ground and you're taking into account the next round and not just your current round. Next one's really cool. Uh, startups only focus on growth. If you're a startup, you have to only focus on growth. As long as your revenue is growing, as long as your MRR is growing, you're doing your job. It's simply not true. A good example of that is what's happening now in the tech industry. A lot of companies that have gone through this cycle, have focused purely on growth, don't exist anymore. You need to focus on value. You need to focus on what problem you're solving. If in the real world, in people's real lives, you're solving an actual problem that they have, you're adding real value to the world, you will always, always continue to grow. So don't focus on growth. Growth is almost a side effect. It's almost a bonus. If your product has market fit, if there's a need and a demand for your product, for what you're selling, people actually need it in their day-to-day -day lives, then you will grow. Growth is almost a side effect of that. So don't focus on the growth, focus on the product, focus on the problem you're trying to solve and the money will roll in, so don't worry about it too much. Uh, next two is a little bit kind of uh, to goes together. One is you have to research and formulate a strategy before you execute. So research, formulate, have a strategy, and then move on. That's total myth. And the second one is you have to have a, a, an MVP, a minimum viable product, before you go to market. So these two kind of go hand in hand. Uh, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't have to have 
uh, an MVP. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have a strategy in mind. Uh, the initial idea that you have, the initial idea that you you found your startup based on the problem that you're trying to solve. And ultimately, you know, five years from now, when you're a multi-million dollar company, you're going to have a completely different product. You're going to pivot so many times along the way to reach that end goal that you're going to end up with something that's completely different than what you initially began with, right? Look at Facebook. Great example. How did Facebook start? Well, Facebook started as a way for college kids to kind of, you know, find each other online, basically, right? That was the whole idea. College kids to find each other online. Facebook now is a is a whole multiverse. It's a whole metaverse of different things that you can do and different people that you can talk with, advertisers and and political campaigns. And there's so many things that happen. It's it's just a different product. It's a whole different thing. So it started off very differently, ended up in a very different place. The way I like to do it and the way that they're doing it now is jungle testing. So you kind of proof it. If you have an idea, spend a you thousand know, bucks, put up a website, drive some traffic to it, see if they convert, see if people actually want to buy what you're selling, uh, you know, pre-sale if you can, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, a crowdfund if you can. So there's a whole bunch of tools out there that exist in the world that will allow you to jungle test and proof your idea before you actually spend time, resources, and energy building a product around it. Building a product that's viable in the market will take you six months, a year, sometimes two, three, it matters the complexity, but it's going to take a long time and a lot, a lot of money, basically. A lot of money, a lot of your time, a lot of resources. Instead of investing all of that and be like, oh, well, you know, you're well, we fucked up. That problem doesn't exist. People don't need this product. Just test it beforehand. Test your assumptions if you can. Uh, do a lean validation board. I mean, these, there's a whole bunch of tools that you can do to prove or disprove the theory that you have before going into any type of MVP cycle or going into any type of strategy or strategizing around it, okay? Last but not least, this is probably my favorite one. Well, if you work at a startup, then your offices are probably really cool. Like when I say work at a startup, I'm sure you guys as well, you have this image in your mind of people, you know, driving around in hoover boards and kind of bicycling around campus and and no absolutely not no startup is a grind there's a reason why it's called startup grind it's a grind i mean we have almost 40 and full-time employees in this office so it's quite big but overall i'm telling you it's not what you think it is that's not how it works it's long hours and we all put in a lot of time and effort to get this business off the ground and get it up and running. It's not just a bunch of people hooverboarding around eating pizza and, and going to the cafe. And this is, it's, no, <laughs> it's simply not true. Our offices are just like any other offices, more or less. We have a coffee machine. We have, you know, a kitchen area, like, like anything that you, any normal office that you would imagine. Uh, the only difference is we have a ton of computers and, you know, spaces for things like server rooms and studios and stuff like that. But overall, I mean, the, the emotion in the office is more or less the same. I think the only difference is that in the startup, the majority of the times, like us, you have stock options, employee stock options. So all of our employees are also shareholders. So from that perspective, I don't necessarily need to be uh, the bad cop all the time as a manager. I can be the good cop because everybody's motivated to do the best anyway. If the business grows, everybody wins and they know it. Um, so from that perspective, the offices don't have to be cool and awesome with like you know, table tennis and stuff like that. No, it's, it's, it's simply not true. It's, it's a myth. Our offices are just like anybody else's office. All right, guys, I think uh, it's enough for this time. If you guys have any other myths, let me know. Uh, if you like the content, if you like us breaking myths, let me know again. I'm thinking about doing a couple more, maybe about myths about marketing, myths about, you know, finance and kind of going into different areas. There's a whole bunch of myths that float around. Uh, if you like the content, once again, please hit, help us out. Hit that subscribe button. Let me know what kind of myths you guys come across every single day in the comments below, and I'll make sure to do a video on that. Thanks for sticking around. I'll see you guys next week.